Well, it's 631. Um, so let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll get started here. Father, we're Elaine Cambrick, would you open us in prayer, please? How about that? Heavenly Father, we just come before you this evening, thanking you for who you are. And Father God, we just pray that our lesson goes, Father God, with no hindrances and help us, Father God, to understand what you have for us this evening. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I was really hoping Elaine Berger was here because her question from last week is going to be discussed tonight. Mm -hmm. Though half of me wants to call her <laughs> and uh, tell her her questions up. Well, we'll just have to watch the video. Um, I forget what the question is. What is her question? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Patience, Joyce. Patience. <laughs> I know that's your strong suit. <laughs> it is. Did I'm very patient. Mm. <laughs> She's practicing patience. Practicing patience, yeah. yeah. Don't ask for that. Mm. Yeah. Because well. God tests it. You ask for patience. All right. So as the text states, Paul has established the principle that throughout Old Testament history, God continually chose a group within Israel who inherited the promises given to the whole nation. However, this selection raises another question. Oh, there she is. Perfect timing. Uh -huh. Good evening, Elaine. She's not, not here yet. Is she here? Oh, yeah, there she is. Okay. Elaine, I just said I'm, you know, we, we were going to the question that you had, and here it is. I'm glad you showed up. <laughs> right okay. on. So I will go back and start reading again. Um, as the text states, Paul had established, has established, I should say, the principle that throughout Old Testament history, God continually chose a group within Israel who inherited the promises given to the whole nation. However... This section raises another question. Has God been practicing unjust discrimination all along? And there's Elaine Cambridge's, or Elaine Berger's question um, that she asked last week. So, Elaine Berger, would you read Romans 9, 14, and 15 for us, please? You'll need to unmute. Romans 9, 14, and 15 say then there is no injustice with God is there may it never be for he says to Moses I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion okay so I would possibly argue that God is unjust, as suggested in verse 14, based on verses 6 through 13. Jamie, would you read 6 through 13 for me, please? Yeah. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by your father Isaac. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, that Esau I have hated. Okay, thank you. And there's, there's one um, word choice of the translation that uh, Jamie read that I need to go back and 
and pull from the New American Standard, it says um, in verse um, 14, no, I beg your pardon, 12, it says God's purpose according to, uh, Jamie, your translation said election. I just want to, it seems a little more, um, to me, a little more clear where it says his choice would stand. So, I mean, it's saying the same thing, just different wording. So, why would someone possibly argue that God is unjust, as suggested, suggested there in 914, based on 6 through 13? Why might somebody argue that God is unjust? Uh, Jamie? Uh, because... He chose the one brother over the other brother mm -hmm. before they were even born, before they even showed if they were good or evil. Okay. Norma, what were you going to say? The same thing Jamie said. Okay. Anybody else? So, and, and you've already answered... Um, from a human standpoint, the choices God made might seem unjust um, because he chose one over another. And why would that statement be true? Yes, he did choose one over another, but why would it seem that his choices were unjust based on the choices he made? Elaine, Camber or Elaine Berger, you mentioned this last week, so... You remember, you got to unmute, can't hear you. You got to unmute, we can't hear you. Go ahead. Uh, I think God was, uh, God was uh, unjust and I felt he was biased. Why? He, because he chose one over the other. I thought we were all the same. Okay. I thought he looked at us all the same, not choosing you over me or me over you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about his choice would seem to strengthen that? Idea? Anybody? I didn't hear you. What about his choices would seem to strengthen that argument that he is unjust? Because the Bible says in um, 11, for they had not even been born. So how can he come to the decision of loving one and loving the other? Say that again. Somebody's speaking. I know. I can't hear. I can't either. Yeah, I can't either. Real speaking. Somebody's feeding back, and I'm not quite sure who. Um, it says in I think it was a link. Okay, go ahead. It says in 11 that the children were not even born yet. So how could he come to the decision of loving one and hating the other? So that's how, to me, it would seem even being unfair. Okay. And he would come to that conclusion because the children weren't even here yet. Okay. Not I have a quite, but he's God. And he knows everything. Right. So that is how come he was able to do that. Because okay. he's an all-knowing God. He knows us before we were ever born. I get that part, but to the human, the question was from a human standpoint, yeah. why does it seem that the choice is unjust? But th from a human side, it's because the kids weren't even born and he came to the conclusion. Well, but I mean, even given the fact that God knows everything, why from a human standpoint would even those choices seem to be unjust? Since he knows everything based on the choices he made. I can't think past he knows yeah. <laughs> Elaine Berger, you kind of hit this last week. Anybody remember? You mean, mean because the one was younger and usually the older one always gets everything and he's the leader of the family and all that stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, that's one piece of it, sure. That Esau, was the eldest, and so, but that's from a cultural standpoint. But even from the fact that God knew these, 
we, we spoke of his foreknowledge last week, the fact that God knows the end from the beginning. He knew what these different ones were going to be like. I mean, consider, uh, oh, wait a minute, I went too far. Yeah. From a human standpoint, the choices might seem unjust. Consider the examples. Jacob, a deceiving younger brother, being chosen by God over a oh, hardworking yeah. Esau. Okay? He didn't care about his birthright. I mean, he gave it up for a stupid boy or suit. <laughs> well, that may be the case, but he was a hardworking guy. He was out, you know, doing what he had to do. Okay, he sold his, his, his birthright for a bowl of soup, but Jacob was a snake. He was sneaky and underhanded. And so from that perspective, it would seem unfair, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying, Joyce? Yeah, but I mean, knowing that he, he didn't want the birthright and God, you know, anyways. No, I, I think there's merit to that argument. God knew that he would reject the birthright, sure. But was, you know, um, but it, 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 when you look at... Um, it, there just seems to be a basis for that kind of an argument. Um, would everybody agree with that statement? That there seems to be a basis for that argument that it, God could be accused of being unjust? Yeah. Any, anybody else? Any thoughts? Or? Okay, just hang it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of examples in the Bible about God being unjust. Oh, okay. That's that choice? I think there's a lot of examples in the Bible being unjust. I had a, always had an issue with the prodigal son story. I always had an issue with the um, um, the workers in the field all getting paid the same when some only worked an hour and some worked 10, you know, whatever it was. I mean, you know. But, of course, you grow and you know and you understand. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, and, and um, the workers in the field, I mean, what was unjust about that? Really, I mean, he promised them 10 bucks a day, and they worked a day, and they got their 10 bucks. You would hope he would be more generous. I've been in the sun all day, and you just came and started working last hour. But what was unjust about it, really? comes right down to it. Can you see me, hon? Uh, no. Where are oh, you? Okay. Um, I, You're I, on the screen. I'm sorry. It, it, um, I, it, it, it doesn't seem fair to us humanly because we feel that because we were working longer, we deserve more. However, did, you know, he said, did, did, did I not promise you 10 bucks? You know? Did I not give that to you? Then, you know, it's his choice. And then I was thinking about um, in Jeremiah when it said um, about the potter and the clay. Okay. You know, it says, but the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel and it pleased the potter to make it. it says, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. You know, it's like, I always say, it's his party. It's he his can, party. He can do as he please. He is the, he's the potter. We are the clay, you know, and um, whether we think it's unjust or unfair, it, it, it's irrelevant. Okay. Because he is God, period. And okay. does he not have a right? Does he not have a right to say, you know, the creator, you know? So that's what I was just thinking. Okay. Any other thoughts, sir? Does that make sense to everybody? Jamie, go ahead. You got unmute. Sorry. And, and, and part of it sometimes, and I think like sometimes when someone has done something wrong and you treat them fairly like you treat everybody else, there's the chance that they will feel guilty about the way they behave mm -hmm. and they won't repeat that behavior in the future. So okay. maybe that's part of it too. 
that's an interesting perspective because um, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Repentance. Mm -hmm. Text says, you know, it's yeah. his kindness that leads us to repentance. Elaine Berger, you're gonna have to unmute again. Your your phone keeps bringing background noise. <laughs> if you want, uh, if you leave it on. Uh, um, didn't didn't um, uh, Jacob repent when he met Esau? Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah he did. <laughs> to Esau. Sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Can't hear me. Right. You, no, if, if you back away from your phone at all, you get a lot of time. Okay, is that better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, didn't Jacob repent to Esau when he came back? I think he did. <laughs> didn't he? he? He sent all his servants and his mm -hmm. animals ahead of himself yeah. to make an offering. So yep. maybe God knew that that was, well, God did know that that was going to happen. But he did repent. Okay. Good point. Okay. So according to the what are some of the essential aspects of God's character that direct his will and purpose? And, um, 915. Uh, Norma, can you read chapter 9, verse 15, please? Do you have it there? Oh, we can't hear you. You're muted. You, you're still muted. I have it, Pastor. If you... Okay, go ahead, Elaine. Uh, we can't hear you, Norma. You were muted. It says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Okay. Okay. So, th and this fits really kind of in with what Kathy was saying. He's gone. Mm -hmm. There you go. You know, and there's a, there's a, passage that says, who are you to question him? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. What essential aspects of God's character that direct his will or purpose are revealed here in verse 15? What's he's going to do what he's going to do. He's going to do what he's going to do. So what is that? What, what character aspect of his will is, or Aspect of his character does that reveal, Ron? All. Kathy, go ahead. I was going to say all powerful. All powerful. Okay. I was going to say he's the man in charge. Man, in, the charge. man in charge. That's all powerful, Dale. That's all powerful. All knowing, omniscience. Omniscience. Okay. Sovereign. Sovereignty. Yeah. yeah. Large and in charge. You know. <laughs> What other aspects of God's character are revealed there? Justice. Justice. What else? Mercy. 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 Mercy's a biggie. Mercy's a biggie. This is defined by the book as to go beyond justice to give someone what he doesn't deserve. Go beyond justice to give someone what he doesn't deserve. I really like that. I mean, we've talked about mercy as being given what we don't deserve and, and grace not being given what we do deserve. But his, I, I like the fact that the, the book defined it as going beyond justice. We, we really don't want justice. Sure. No, no, I don't. <laughs> no, it, if it comes right down to it, we really don't want justice. Because justice would put us all in Dutch. I'm just telling the truth. You know, we want mercy. And uh, the Greek communicates an intent to help. And I, I really like that as well. Mercy has an intent to help. 
So that's its focus and its, its uh, real purpose. Uh, the Greek communicates, oh, I said that already, the Greek communicates the intent to help. What else does, what other aspect of God, of his character is here that directs his will? Norma? Compassion. Compassion. Compassion's good, yeah. Compassion is absolutely uh, uh, an aspect of God's character that is revealed here. He's compassionate uh, toward us. And uh, the Greek for compassion speaks of sympathetic feelings which seek expression in tears. That's God's compassion. He, he recognizes who we are, and he's compassionate toward us. He, he almost, you know, you, you see somebody that, have you ever seen somebody that just absolutely broke your heart and you're compassionate and it tears well up in your eyes. And that's the aspect of who God is that's behind his decision-making process. Um, while not stated there specifically, an understanding of the nature of man is strongly implied. He knows who we are. The scripture says he knows that we're but dust. And that, uh, you know, he knows that about us. Something else that struck me um, that I did not put into the notes because I think it was actually after last week's study that I didn't put in here is what ultimately, well, not what ultimately, another aspect of God's character that drives his decision making is his goodness. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. We say it at the church. We don't have to worry about God being vindictive. We don't have to worry about God being uh, cynical. We don't have to worry about God being evil, because none of those things are who God is. God is good. So whatever choices he makes, we have to recognize and appreciate that his goodness is behind it. Would you agree with that statement? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else before we move on here? Joyce? One thing I discovered while um, I was studying it because, um, you know, I was actually thinking about the prodigal son and the workers of the field and what I used to think about that. And what became known to me is that, like, God is um, a benefactor, and a benefactor is someone who owns. So, you know, he's creator, so he owns everything. He's God, he owns everything. He's not just a governing body over us, whereas, like, our government might give us stuff to appease us or sentence us with justice. Okay. He's a benefactor, so he's the owner, so he is the only one that really can give. Okay. You know, so he's the only sovereign power that has the liberty, you know, to do as he wills without questioning. And no one reports to him. He doesn't have to report to us, you know, because he's the benefactor. He's the owner. Okay. Yeah, That's keep true. in mind, what would exist without God? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> you know, everything that is came into being because he brought it about. Mm -hmm. You know, he spoke. And light came into existence. Mm -hmm. Let there be light. Yeah. And there was. Yes. And everything after that, God brought into existence. So that's 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 good, Joyce. You know. That's what I like his name, I am. You know, when he said to Moses, yeah. I am that I am. I mean, that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say that. I mean, you know, I'm Joyce. I was born 1959 and who knows when I'll die, but I am not I am. Yeah. I'm not going to care for you. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Anything else, anybody? Okay. So reread Romans 3, 19 and 20, and 23 through 24. And uh, Joyce, would you read? Uh, well, Shirley, we didn't get you to read it, did we? Would you read yeah, 19 and 20? Why, why are you reading? And then... Um, Norma, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Want to read 23 and 24, please? After, okay. After Shirley reads 19 and 20. 
Black okay. Woman. All right. Now we know that whatever the law says. Wait, wait, wait. Are you in three? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in nine. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped it and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, but by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, and now Norma 23 through 24, please. Okay, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the... Oh, wait a minute, wait. Are you in, in chapter 3? No, I'm in chapter... Oh, yes. I'm in ch oh okay, 3. I got... I'm at 10. Well, that's where I was a minute ago. So if you can get to three real quick, 23 and 24. I'm at three. Okay. 20, 23 and 24, right? Yes. Uh, 21. Being justified <laughs> freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ wait, wait, wait. Jesus. You're, you're still not in 323. Yeah, I am. Oh, yeah, I am. Oh, okay. I was 24 first. Sorry. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so does, does any person have a right to be chosen by God? Yes. Or does anyone have, uh, have a right to be chosen by God or receive his mercy? Why or why not? Norma, you said yes. Why do we have a right to be chosen by God? Because he knew beforehand. Because he prepared it beforehand for us. But do we have a right to be chosen? No. Anybody disagree? Shirley, you said no. Uh, yeah, I said no because of what it says in 23. Uh, we all, all, everyone has sinned. Okay. And all have fallen short of his glory. So we don't have the right uh, to expect God to choose us. We can pray that he does. We can hope that he does, but we don't yeah. have that right. Okay. I'm confused. Yeah. Okay. Because if God, it's this is where my mindset is. It says, do we have a right to be chosen by God? God's the one that chooses us in the first place. Right. But do we have a right to be chosen by God? We don't have Chosen through his mercy. Uh, I don't, because I'm looking at if God chooses me, then who says I don't have that right? Well, yeah, no, no. I'm not understanding. Not, not after being chosen. Do any of us deserve to be chosen by God? No. 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 I'll say no to that. Yeah, and that's that's what I meant by right. Okay. We have a right to be chosen. We have. Okay. Do we deserve to be chosen by no. him? The answer is no. No, we don't, because we're all guilty of sin. Right. Of violating God's will and insisting on doing things our own way. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's but yes, because we're seeing ten minutes promises. What's that, Joyce? Oh no, I was just telling Bill. I said I wrote actually no because we're sinners. But yes, because we received him, if through 24 talks about salvation and redemption in Christ oh, wow, Jesus wow. and his promises, all his promises. But so, that's after the fact. Right. That's after we've been chosen. Okay. You know, we don't have a right to be chosen by him. We don't deserve it. Right. No. no. None of us deserve it. That's a reality of it. We saw that earlier. That's why this is pointing back to chapter three. None of us deserve hey. salvation. Oh, yeah, but we no, no one who's ever been born because we've all rebelled against God. We've all rejected his way and chosen our own way. Mm -hmm. um, now, what does that answer tell us about our insistence on demanding rights from God? <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, smirk. <laughs> uh, that we're unworthy to demand anything because we really don't have a leg to stand on. Like we deserve nothing <laughs> daily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
We, we have absolutely no basis for demanding rights from God. You know, we, we live in a country where uh, our rights to do what we want to do are being shouted about. You know, we have rights to do what we want to do. And uh, the, one of the big uh, tensions today is this whole face mask requirement uh, based on COVID-19. And, you know, I have a right. I don't have to wear a mask. Well, I read three different instances this past week. Young men in their 30s mm -hmm. died from this disease because yep. they insisted on their rights. Yep. You know, we don't, we certainly can't demand rights that we have rights before God. He doesn't owe us anything. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> So we have no we have no right to demand mm -hmm. any rights. Elaine, you got a question mark on your face. No, I was just thinking. <laughs> what are you thinking? Okay. I'm, just everything you were saying, I was going over. Just the the right of the mask and the right not being you know we don't have a right. And I agree. I'm just agreeing. And oh, okay. Over All everything right. you were saying. <laughs> Okay. I agree. Okay. I just didn't understand the question when it said, does God have a right? And I, yes, I got confused. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I'm on point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now this one, this one, everybody get your Bibles handy because we got a lot of scriptures here. I got them tight. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're going to go back around a couple of times here. There's eight of us, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of us in the room. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Shamil, Shamazo. <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll start through Kathy. Would you take Exodus four twenty one? Ron, can you or Dale, if you would get Exodus eight fifteen nineteen and thirty two? Joyce, if you could get Exodus fourteen one through four. Everybody remember what I gave you because I'm not going to remember who I gave what. I got it written down. Oh, you got them written down? Yes. Good. Okay, Joyce, and also take Exodus 14, 1 through 4, and then verse 17. Elaine Cambrick, get Exodus uh, 14, 29 through – no, Joyce, go ahead and take 29 through 30. Read them all. Yeah. Yeah, read them all. Uh, Elaine Cambrick, take Deuteronomy – 15, 7, and 8. Okay. Shirley, Joshua, 11, 19, and 20. Norma, you get over. You got a short one. 1 Samuel 6, 6. <laughs> well, you know what? If Can you stick your finger there and then also stick Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me try 6, 6. Okay. Go ahead. Where do you want to go from there? And then stick your finger there and then go to Proverbs 28, 14 and stick a finger there. You okay, got two hold on. Let me, do this. Each. Let me okay. do it this way. <laughs> All right. Okay. I can do both, Pastor. I got it. Thank you, Ron. Isaiah 19, 19 through 2. And then Jamie, Isaiah 42, 1 and then 6 through 7. Yeah, uh, that's everybody. No, Elaine uh, Berger. Mark 3, 1 through 6. And then I'll go and get Mark 3, 6, 45 through 52. And Mine doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't, Jim. What does that mean? to 2? What? Isaiah 19, 19 dash 2. Must be 21. Whoops. It's 19 through 22, I think. 19, 19 through 22. 
Great. This thing is paper. Please stand by. <laughs> do, 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 you know, when I just do, went over this this afternoon, it made sense when I read it. It's 19 to 22, Ron. 19 to 22. Okay. okay. And then I'll find Mark. Okay, so everybody got their passages here. Yep. Everybody ready to go? Yep. All right. So when it's your turn, just go ahead and start reading. And we'll get through all of these. Okay. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And then the magicians had... <laughs> Uh, then the magician said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hardened not unto them as the Lord had said. Hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before pi Harephath, between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of baal Zephon, opposite by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, They are wanderingly, wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, and they did so. There was not a city that Great. made peace. Oh. I still have more to go. I will have to turn the page. <laughs> As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. That the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. I'm done. I'm reading from Deuteronomy in James Version 15, 7, 8. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thy hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thy hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wants. Okay, Shirley. Okay, uh, Joshua 11, 19 through 20. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hil Hil Hilvites, the inhabitants of Gideon, all the other they took in battle. Uh, it was the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle that they might utterly be destroyed, they might utterly destroy them, and that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them as the Lord has commanded Moses. Okay. Why then, why then do you harden your heart as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he did mighty things among you? Did they not let the people go that that they might depart. Okay, I'm coming for the 28 too. Uh, 2014, okay. Uh, happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Okay. In that 
day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts and the land of Egypt, for they will cry out to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send a savior and a champion. He will deliver them. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. And then they will even worship with sacrifice and offerings and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing, so they will return to the Lord and he will respond to them and will heal them. Okay, Jane. Okay, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Okay. And Elaine, you've got to unmute again. I had to mute you because it was feeding back. There you go. Mark 3, 1 through 6. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Okay. And I'm supposed to have chapter six verse. My apologies, got the wrong verse. Everybody else got it right but the preacher. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the seas and intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out. And they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves and the fishes, but their heart was hardened. And then 8, 14 through 21. It says, and they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves into 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12. And he, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets of bro broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? Now, that, that's a lot of reading, and the intention was for everybody who had done that on your own before. But 
Um, I don't know what happened to my. I'm trying to do too much. There we go. Okay. So. How the answer. God's hardening of a person's heart. What's that, Dale? Yeah, I tipped my hand. You weren't supposed to see that. How is God's hardening of a person's heart different from a person hardening their own heart? How is God's hardening of a person's heart different from a person hardening their own heart? Ron? Um, you get you make that choice to harden your heart. If God does it, it happens. You you have the choice. You know what I mean? Okay. Jamie, when God hardens somebody's heart, it is to gain glory for Him and His kingdom. When we harden our hearts, it because it's because of our own selfish desires. And that's really the rub. Mm -hmm. that, that really is very well stated, Jamie, because yeah. it's essentially what I had written here. It seems to me that God, when God hardens hearts, it suits his purpose and ultimately brings him glory. But he does so in alignment with the person's leanings or preferences. And that's the other side of it. God doesn't just harden a person's heart because he wants to be vindictive. He's just allowing them really to have what they want anyways, but he's solidifying it and he's doing so for his own purposes and to bring glory to his name. And that might seem unfair, but let's track the, back to what Kathy said earlier. He's God. If you or I compel someone or reinforce somebody taking action that benefits us, we're being egocentric. None of us deserve that kind of um, service. Mm -hmm. But God is God, and he deserves all of the glory. So when he hardens a person's heart, it's in alignment with who they are and their leanings anyways. Uh, you know, Judas was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus, and God just hardened his heart and let him have his own way. And go and fulfill the role that he had. And at the end of it, he repented. Um, so when God hardens the heart, it's in line with their leanings anyways. And it's for his purpose to bring about glory to his name. An individual, as Jamie stated, hardens their heart when something or someone is not to their personal liking. I don't like that person. I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they talk. And so I'm talk to the hand. Does that track? Hmm? Yeah. Comments, thoughts? I was thinking of uh, King Saul and he had so many opportunities when, uh, you know, it's like, what, what do I hear this bleeding, <laughs> you know? And, and then, you know, at the end of it all, could we say that God had hardened his heart? You know, I no, King Saul in, in the, I don't think on the front end, I think you, you touched on it, Dale. Initially, yeah. Saul was given every opportunity. Right. He was the anointed. Yes. Yeah. You know, God even said later, you know, it, it, the, through the prophet, if you would have yielded to what God wanted to do in you, essentially your, your kingdom would have been established forever. And from this point, vantage point in history, we know that he would have been like David. And the Messiah would have come through him. So initially, no, I think you're right. He was given every choice. He hid behind the baggage. He chose to early on to make the decisions he made. Then at the end of his later in his life, God hardened his heart. Mm -hmm. But it was just in line with with his decision. Meetings anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But as individuals, when we harden our heart, it's because. And, and isn't it really, if you think about it, aren't we manifesting our being made in the likeness of God? But we don't have the right to take that position. Ooh. 
what's the scripture? Is it in Revelation where it's like they were given over to a reprobate mind? That was uh, uh, Sister Drury's, one of her favorite uh, <laughs> uh, pieces of scripture. So given over a reprobate heart, reprobate mind, yeah. Reprobate mind. But you, you see what I'm saying? When, when we insist on hardening our hearts towards somebody, it's kind of like we want it our way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we don't like something about somebody, or we don't like a particular individual or the way they do things. So we harden our heart against them. Does that make sense to you? The distinction between the two? Comments, questions? Okay. All right. Here's a, no pun intended, hard question. <laughs> Is your heart hard in any areas, how can you find out? Let's let's skip the first question uh, and and ask how can you find out if your heart is hard, Norma? By praying. By praying. How else? Yeah, and I would agree with praying, asking God, show me areas of my heart that are hard. How else can we? find out how about reading the scriptures being exposed by the word of God revealing in us those insistences that we have those harden harden hardnesses yeah the hardnesses that are in us when, when he shows us those things about us that ought not to be. Uh, Norma, you said pray. Let me, let me tell you something. That's a, that's a dangerous prayer. Why is it a dangerous prayer to ask God to show me the hardness of my heart or the weaknesses in my life? Why is that a dangerous prayer? Because he will. Because he will. That's right. If you don't want him to do so, don't ask him. Cap it. And then once he does, then you have to deal with it at that time. That it is now your responsibility. You know? That's the other side of it. But also, I was also thinking, you know, brothers and sisters in the Lord can help point out hardness. And, you know, we have each other to keep each right. other accountable. Mm -hmm. If we're willing to receive. If, if we're willing. You know, too, I, I think sometimes people put, God puts people in our lives Mm -hmm. So that when we look at how they're living their life and we compare ourselves to like, and, and I'll use an example, like um, there's a woman that I work with and, um, you know, I'm at the food pantry and I'll hand people their stuff and some people struggle with taking it to the car. Well, this one woman was helping and she walked many, many blocks with this person and carried this stuff for her. Mm -hmm. So like when I saw it, it really made me take a step back and think about it because I think God put her there at that moment mm -hmm. to teach me a valuable lesson. Okay. But That's you right. have to be open to receiving that message and sort of looking at situations like that and because I said her thing, I'm like, she's such a wonderful person. Yeah. And then my second thought was like, mm, I probably wouldn't have walked 10 blocks in 94 degree heat carrying, Ooh. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it sort of was like a little eye opener for me too. So we have to have our, our eyes open, our hearts open. Right. And what's around us. Ron, you were going to say something? Looked like you were on the cusp of saying something. Me? Yeah, you. No. Uh, no? You're the only one in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll throw out another example, too. Sure. Is when Ron and I first started dating, we were having dinner downtown, and a homeless person fell in, in front of us, and our meal had just been ordered, and Ron excused himself, and I thought he was going to the men's room. But I was watching what was going on outside, and people were literally stepping over this man. 
and I, I felt bad that he fell and stuff, but he was like a bad person. And, you know, I don't want to catch any diseases. This is what's going through my head and stuff like that. Right. Next thing I know, there's my, he's my husband now, but then my boyfriend, I see him out there all of a sudden helping this man up and putting him on a bench. And he took both of his hands and like had them on his face and he was talking to him. And I thought to myself, like, I thought I was a good person, but by that measurement, I was not. And that's but probably the point. But here was this man. That, yeah. yeah. And that, that yeah. was the, probably the point where I knew I wanted to be with him forever, you know? And so that's like another one of those, like, like sometimes God puts people in your path. Yeah. Who make it apparent what you're lacking or what you need to work on too. So. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else? So let's go back to the first question. Is your hard, heart hard in any areas? As we go around the room, is there, and I, I find it rather providential that it's 727 because we don't have a whole bunch of time here. We don't want to belabor the point. Saved by the bell. Amen. <laughs> but if, is there, would anybody here admit that you know that there is an area of your heart that is hard? Yes. Or is there an area of you yes. that your heart is hard? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone that would like to share something? I know. No compelling here. Nobody, Kathy Shane read no way. I am not admitting that one. Yeah. I can admit, I do not like the president of the United States. Okay. And I pray daily for God to help me. And the minute when I think that I'm over him, he <laughs> says something. <laughs> and I have to start all over again. And I have to ask God, do I hate this man? I really need to find out, do I hate it? Because I always say, I don't hate anybody. But when I say I don't like him, and I don't, then I have to ask myself, do you hate him? So I think my heart is hard towards him. I know it is. And I need prayer in resolving that feeling that I have for him. Okay. And we're, we're going to close out with prayer tonight. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, I don't want to rush or cut anybody off, but anybody else, there's something that you wanted to, to say? When, when I uh, prepared this study, I mean, I answered it that I would like to say no, that there are no areas of my heart that are hard. Um, but I'm fairly certain it is likely that there, there is. And it seems to me that the only way we get to find out is by asking the Lord uh, for his convicting by his spirit. But I, I could tell you that um, just recently, uh, the Lord kind of put a red hot poker on an area of my life uh, mm. where I found uh, I was, I, I'm, I'm very critical sometimes. And I ought not to be that way. And, uh, I didn't hear you. I said, I'm, I'm critical. <laughs> and um, it, I felt like as I was reflecting on this, getting ready for this study, that I, I and that critical nature, that critical perspective that I often tend to come into situations about puts up a hardness in me. And uh, so I, I would confess that to you tonight and ask you to pray for me. But uh, um, if we look at verses 9, uh, 15 and 18 here in chapter 9, it says, um, For he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then verse 18 says, So then he has mercy on whom he has, on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Not quite sure why I put that passage in there, but at any rate, um, it, it's time to call it a night. Uh, I, I've seen several around the room that have acknowledged that 
you would have to admit that there's hardness in you in one area or another. Uh, so as we close out our time together tonight, let's just close with a word of prayer. And remember to pray for one another through the course of the week that the Lord would help us to overcome these hardnesses in our heart. Because as we've seen tonight, if, if there's a hardness in us, we're choosing to embrace that. Because it's something that we we like or don't like. Any, any comments, questions before we close out? Okay. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your hand on our lives. I thank you for this gathering of your people that come week in and week out and consider the truth of your word and weigh and learn and embrace, faith against and repent. Lord, I, I thank you for your hand at work in our lives. I thank you that that you are the one that softens the hardened heart. You take that heart of stone and you replace it with a heart of flesh. Not, not a fleshly heart, but a tender heart, a compassionate heart. Lord, I pray that tonight, as each and every one of us have acknowledged that there's likely, if we don't know it, there are areas in our hearts that are hard. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to have your heart of mercy, your heart of tenderness, your heart of compassion toward others. Lord, uh, again, we thank you for your work in our lives. We yield to you a fresh tonight. We pray that you would be honored and glorified in and through us in the balance of our week. Gather us together again on Sunday to hear your word proclaimed and to move the work of your spirit between now and then. And we'll thank and praise and honor you as you're doing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.